I'm going to list five secondaries for mental health and I'll add a bonus number six at the end. Secondaries to mental health aren't as clear cut as other secondary claims like nerve damage due to your lumbar spine because you can't really x-ray or MRI your mental health conditions or conditions that stem from your mental health. So it's a bit more difficult. Service connection for mental health is relatively not as easy as some, um, which brings us to the point I want to make. And if you know the channel, you know th the answer is always going to be evidence. You have to submit your claim with evidence. You have to. Starting with number one, because I firmly believe the changes to sleep apnea will put a stop to sleep apnea secondary mental health claims because right now they're very common. I don't think they're going to be as common here in the near future. So currently sleep apnea with the CPAP is a solid 50% rating and it's rarely connected direct unless you have a sleep study from service which forces veterans to claim sleep apnea secondary and the most common one we see is mental health and other respiratory conditions like sinusitis or rhinitis. The reason why I say we won't see as many of these claims anymore is because of two things and when you put them together it makes a huge difference in a, in a negative way for veterans to be honest with you. First, sleep apnea will be rated most commonly at 0% as the CPAPs generally work and ease your symptoms and that assumes you're able to wear the device. Now the 50% criteria still stands for those that are not able to wear the mask due to coexisting disabilities, but the new criteria states that a medical professional must make that determination, which implies that the veterans will need what? They will need evidence to show that they are unable to wear the mask and mental health all is a part of that condition, right? So if your anxiety or your insomnia prevents you from wearing the, the mask, you're good to go according to the new changes, okay? This is not my opinion, and I honestly don't like this one, but it's what we got. Secondly, mental health does not cause sleep apnea, which I understand is also against popular, popular belief, okay? There are studies that show strong correlation, and there are studies that show zero causation. Those can't be discounted due to a few studies showing the cause. Now again, this isn't my opinion, I'm just regurgitating what the medical consensus on the topic is. I'm not in a position by any means to even speculate on that topic. These are just the facts. That being said, sleep apnea can still be secondary to mental health, but the connection will be on a basis of correlation and aggravation and will need multiple correlating factors like obesity, breathing in heavy particulates, so like burn pits and stuff, medication, and there are many other correlating factors. Those three are just the most common. Now moving on to number two will be GERD, and GERD can be rated anywhere from 10 to 60%, but these will soon also change, but GERD is gonna, GERD is gonna be a solid rating. Regardless, there is a causative link between GERD and mental health, specifically on the anxiety side of the house. This is a pretty common secondary connection, which really sucks when these claims are denied. I am a fan of independent medical opinions and private DBQs, but I only recommend even considering those options if you've been denied and you have the evidence. Nine out of 10 times, veterans will not need to consider an IMO or private DBQ with their claim, but sometimes it happens, okay? And I don't like that one bit either. The reason why I say I don't recommend that for veterans out the gate is because most veterans won't even need to consider one. Some will, some won't. I'm a fan of being denied and always having the, um, having the evidence, but if you got money out, out the wall zoo and you don't mind spending, you know, eight, $900 on a, Nexus letter for GERD secondary mental health, go for it. That is completely your prerogative. Now, number three shares the same rating as GERD, so it's a bit more complicated on if you go this route or not. Uh, but that claim is number or is IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. The VA will rate the higher of the two of GERD and IBS. 
Now, IBS can be rated at 10 or 30%, and not only is this a common secondary to mental health, but it's also presumptive under the PACT Act. So if you meet PACT Act criteria, get a diagnosis, do not worry about secondary service connection. For those of you who do not rate the PACT Act criteria for IBS, secondary to mental health is a pretty solid link. If your GERD is rated at 0%, and then there is no way in the world I would ever recommend paying for an IMO or private DBQ for IBS because your rating will not change. Remember, GERD and IBS share the same rating. Going on to number four on this list, which is hypertension. Now, hypertension is, a no is another weird one. Now, this one is my personal opinion, okay? Hypertension is severely underrated. Okay, it's generally rated at zero or 10%, which which kind of sucks in my opinion. Um, so it may not be worth it, especially if it's not going to raise your overall rating. Now, there's another side to that because another factor to consider is what secondary stem from hypertension as hypertension in heart conditions or diabetes can lead to a cause of death. And that's the other side. And those that could leave some additional benefits for survivors of veterans in those specific cases. And number five, the last one, except for our bonus, is migraines. Migraines can be rated at 10 or 30 or 50% and is an absolute solid rating that can raise your overall rating. Of note, this is also one of the most commonly rated conditions at 0%. I always stress to veterans, especially in migraine cases, the need for current evidence showing symptoms, and that is absolutely crucial. A perfect migraine would have the evidence needed for service connection, which are all the big three, for secondaries, and in addition, evidence showing symptom severity. So prescriptions would be a solid, uh, refills on those prescri prescriptions excuse me, would be solid. So the reason I say prescriptions is because it shows, so medication shows severity and refills or how many times you take that medication shows frequency and that is hard medical evidence, which is a lot stronger than just a self-report. And of course, a personal statement supporting your current evidence. And within that personal statement, I would also include your migraine log, which we shared with our healthcare team. If given a 0% with that evidence, a very simple higher level review with an informal conference is in process as the VA cannot ignore medical evidence and that is when a higher level review comes in clutch. Now for those of you that stayed till the end, here's your bonus number six, six which lies on the SMC scale and that is SMCK, which is about an extra $130 per month and rated at 0%. For males, that will be erectile dysfunction or ED. And for the female side of the house, that would be female sexual arousal, arousal disorder or FSAD. Now, this is commonly connected through medication for mental health conditions, as almost all of the medication causes ED and FSAD. Extremely easy to connect, and I'd recommend speaking to your doctor about the, the condition first and then submitting the secondary. This will most likely end up as an ACE as your only evidence needs to be reviewed. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now the big three remains the big three no matter what, except for secondary conditions. I guess it's not no matter what. For service connection on secondary conditions, you need these three aspects and if you don't have them, you will be denied straight up, period, point blank. First, you need a service connected disability, which is in this case gonna be mental health. I'm saying mental health as an umbrella because there are many diagnoses under mental health. The second thing you need is a current diagnosis of the secondary condition. So if you are claiming hypertension, you need a diagnosis for hypertension, okay? Now you could have medical evidence showing um, high blood pressure, which is good, but it's not as good as submitting that claim with a current diagnosis. Now some claims like sleep apnea are a little weird because if you don't have a diagnosis of sleep apnea, the VA will most likely schedule an exam for you to get a sleep study. That would give you a diagnosis. But still, I recommend talking to your healthcare team and submitting your claim with that diagnosis up front, personally. And last but not least is the nexus. Now for secondary claims, the nexus is medical in nature, 
which will have to link your current diagnosis to your service-connected disability. I always recommend to veterans when submitting a secondary claim to gather evidence that supports the connection and indicates the primary service-connected disability is the cause. So for instance, that would look something like this. If I were claiming hypertension secondary, I would speak to my healthcare team and let them know when I get super anxious and I start to worry and I start to freak out and have panic attacks, my heart starts beating, I can feel my blood pressure, um, I get lightheaded, you know, X, Y, Z, here are my symptoms. I take my blood pressure at home and it always reads, you know, 144 over 100 or whatever your numbers are. I don't have hypertension, so I'm not sure what common numbers are when you have panic attacks. Now, that is not a slam dunk to your nexus, um, but it is evidence in support of your claim. And personally, I am a huge fan of any evidence in support of your claim, especially if it's coming from your primary healthcare team.